Hi, I'm Kate Wallen Elliott. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, and this is the F 150 Lightning Platinum. Let's take it for a ride, Kate. Big F-150 Lightning, Kate. You look, um, you look indifferent behind the wheel. Yeah, I've driven a lot of vans and trucks through the years, and yes, this drives very well. I mean, not on this kind of road. This kind of road, it you feel like you're in a large boat. It's wafty. It it's, is. It soaks up the majority of the bumps, but because it's got such a big set of springs and such a lot of suspension travel it doesn't exactly keep you firmly in your seat on corners no no that it does not but it does handle or ride very well for a truck yeah i mean the, this truck is built with a large suspension travel right so it's going to be quite bouncy on on curves and twisty roads like this but that's not really where it's meant to be and unlike the Rivian R1T, which handles equally well and is substantially smaller and easier to maneuver on roads like this, the Rivian has a whole load of air suspension and, and smart suspension and a lot of technology in that part of the truck where the F-150 Lightning just has old fashioned springs and dampers and struts. And I think it is a really well judged vehicle because the Ford F-150 is America's best-selling truck, and it's replacing that with an electric vehicle. For the majority of those people, that F-150 is not being used to carry massive loads or being used to tow a large trailer or anything like that. They might be using it occasionally to tow a boat. Right, Ford has said through its own research that the majority of pickup truck drivers do tow with their vehicles but most of them only tow across town or a couple of hours. They're not towing cross country like I've done with my own F-150 Lightning and it did just fine. Designing a truck that has a familiarity for existing pickup truck owners is very important, I think, because there's nothing about this truck that would put off a hardened pickup truck fan, other than maybe the lack of hearty V8 under the bonnet. And instead, you've got that massive mega power frunk with all of the functionality that Ford has built into that. And you've got incredibly low running costs. You have. I mean, the maintenance costs on an F-150, if you're really using it a fair amount, are going to be pretty high. And the maintenance costs on this are going to be negligible. I think designing the F-150 Lightning and making sure that the bed and other components within the F-150 were interchangeable with internal combustion and hybrid F-150s has meant that the F-150 Lightning has been really a, a, a genius design move by Ford. You can buy pretty much any accessory that will fit in an internal combustion engine hybrid F-150 and install it in the bed of the truck. And that's helped keep costs down, but it's also ensuring a familiarity that a lot of customers have is continued. Yeah, and being able to transition those accessories. I mean, that actually is a big financial investment, particularly for fleets or people who have multiple trucks in their business. Mm -hmm. That's an enormous financial investment in the accessories. And that kind of decision to, to make it compatible does really breed that kind of loyalty to, well, they've supported me, my truck's been good, I want another one, I'm just going to get 
the electric version of the truck I already mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And also the sustainability in that, right? So you're not throwing away things after you've you've sold the car. How many of us have cars with accessories that we no longer have cars for? So whether it be roof rails, you buy a you buy a set of towers for your brand new car so you can put roof rails on your car. Then you sell the car. You don't sell the tower with the car because you probably still want to keep the roof rack and all the accessories. So you end up amassing all these spare parts for cars you no longer own. Being able to transfer things from one F-150 to another is, is really important. Additionally, for the driver, the familiarity with the ICE F-150 is really important. There's no weird bugs in weird places. Everything operates as it normally would. A lot of people have criticized this gear shifter, for example, and said, we don't need a massive gear shifter in an electric vehicle. And you're right, we could reclaim some, some real estate inside the truck if we used a slightly different arrangement. But the reality is that in keeping this lever here, you're allowing people who are maybe a little bit distrustful of, of touch screens and buttons, the ability to have something tangible and, and familiar that they can control. The ability of the gear lever to fold down, of course, is something that all F-150s of the current generation have. And it's nice to see that transferred into the electric. But all in all, the cabin of this truck, if you blindfolded someone and you put them in this truck and you piped a fake engine noise through, no one would know that this was an electric F-150. They yeah. would just think it was a regular high-end internal combustion F-150. So my criticisms of this as a truck are the same criticisms I would have of pretty much any F-150. The turning circle is abysmal. The suspension is very bouncy when the truck is not uh, loaded down. And it is huge. Those are all criticisms that I have of any F-150. Yeah, I mean, the, the criticism I have of it is really more of a philosophical thing about me not liking trucks this big uh, and not something I'm leveling specifically at the F-150. I mean, it is very large for the amount of capacity you get mm -hmm. on the pickup bed. But again, this is really a very much luxury targeted truck and I don't think other people are going to be concerned that they can't get a 12-foot sheet of drywall on the truck bed. Let's also touch on the fact that people have already started to customize these. Someone on one of the F-150 Lightning forums has put Raptor wheels on it. It gives them a, a few extra inches of ground clearance. It gives them a slightly more ruggedized looking truck. It drives the same. Maybe the range has dropped a bit. Yeah. But that's the other thing, right? The Platinum doesn't have the range of the other models. Yeah, that is a funny little quirk because of the extra doohickeys inside. That extra weight means that this doesn't go quite as far. All other extended range variants of the F-150 Lightning mm -hmm. have 320 miles EPA range, which is about 500 and some kilometers. This version has a 300 mile range, which is 484 kilometers, if memory serves correctly. And it's because of all the extra stuff on board. These seats are not light. They are massaging seats. They are fly fold flat seats. They're not actually very comfortable when you lie them flat though, I've got to admit. No, they're not. They're and they're not. not as comfortable as my seats in my truck because they've got all these extra massage components in them. And the seat feels less like a, like a Barker lounger and more like a, um, it feels stiffer, right? It doesn't feel quite as plush. The fact that we've been able to, to drive this around town and we've been able to drive it on the freeway and drive it through country, I think is a real testament to how this truck can, can really perform in a variety of different situations. And one of the things that's nice when you're driving an EV that is laden is that it is not work. Like driving a gas vehicle, driving a diesel truck, even if it's got a lot of torque low down, you still have to work. You're still shuffling through the gears. You're mm -hmm. still 
you're still very much aware of, I have a lot of stuff that I'm towing or I have a lot of weight on board. And yeah, I put 900 pounds of bark chip in the back and it drove pretty much exactly the same as it did without 900 pounds bark chip in the back. And you know what I really like about this? It's the fact that if I'm in traffic like this, I can just squeeze the go pedal and turn on the wipers and it just goes. It is like driving my Bolt in that regards. With my Bolt, I always had the power and the ability to escape a sticky situation. And it feels like the F-150 Lightning gives you that. And of course I have blind spot warning so I can tell if somebody's in my blind spot because this pickup truck does have some pretty chonking blind spots. Visibility at the rear is excellent, but the B pillar isn't exactly small. No. There's not a lot about this truck that is small other than its energy consumption when you compare it to other pickup trucks. Compare it to every other EV on the market today and this is the most inefficient thing or certainly feels like that. You know, the best I've seen is about 2.5 to 3 miles per kilowatt hour. Yeah, I think actually coming down here today, which was straight motorway, I got 1.8, right. which is not stellar. Let's see what but, it's got. It doesn't have the same setup as mine, so let me let me do this the uh, the old fashioned way here. Yeah. I don't know if you realise this, but you can set up your own display screen that tells you exactly how you're doing. So I'm apparently yes. doing 4.7 miles per kilowatt hour, which is the best I've ever seen. To be fair, we did just drive down a big <laughs> hill. We did. I've just turned on Blue Cruise. And it's very easy to use. You set the speed that you want. Uh, right now it thinks the speed limit is 30 for some reason, which it isn't. It's uh, 50 through here. You set the speed limit and off it goes and it follows the car in front. It tells you if you're not watching the road like it did then because I was paying attention to the to setting the correct speed and it handles everything. I do have my hands on the wheel right now. It feels like it feels like autopilot at this point. So when you have your hands on the wheel, the truck behaves very much like Tesla's autopilot. It will lane keep, it will make sure you're the correct distance from the car in front, it will auto brake and accelerate as required. What it also does, which I think is very good, is it allows you to change lanes and then it automatically reactivates once you are in the new lane, which is something that, that the comma system that you have does. Well, the comma system will lane change for you. Mm -hmm. So you tell it, I want to change lane, and then you tell it, I want to change lane now, and it will do the lane change. Right, so it's actually slightly even slightly more advanced than Blue Cruise at that point. Whereas Tesla's system, when you change lanes, you then have to reactivate autopilot. Um, we're talking autopilot, not autopilot, full self-driving beta. By or the, way. the other autopilot variant enhanced. that was enhanced that was available for a period of time. So right now I'm controlling the, the truck. I'm going to hit the resume button and then it is going to turn on. In a minute it will probably tell me to keep my hands on the wheel because how Ford's Blue Cruise works is it has a map of all of the roads that are compatible. And when you are going through tight curves, Ford, Ford basically asks you to keep your hands on the wheel because it wants to be reassured that you're not going to go careening off the road. So right now I have my hand, one of my hands, now I've got both hands on the wheel and the truck is steering. I'm not actually doing the steering. I just have my hands on the wheel reassuring it. When we get up here a bit, it will actually tell me I can take my hands off the wheel once we were up past the zoo. And at that point, you can put your hands in your lap and, and off you go. It's very much a stress reliever on a long distance trip. It reduces your exhaustion, I feel. Yes. And it is a very competent safety feature. Now, sometimes it struggles. There's a bridge into Washington state on the i5 that it really does not like going over it will pretend it's doing fine and then it gets second thoughts yes it gets very upset yes it does when you are coming up to certain off ramps it sometimes 
has a moment where it second guesses where you should be in terms of lane position, but it's getting better and better and better, just like Tesla Autopilot. And I think that this feature is extremely competent and is better in this truck than it was in the Ford Mustang Mark E that we drove last year. Yeah, I definitely feel like you can see the trajectory with it and it is improving. Presumably it's improving with the over the air updates. Although as you've commented, the notes on the over the air updates are just like, we fixed stuff. Yay. Yeah. So there was one update where Ford basically went, we fixed stuff, enjoy. And then the second update we had, the over the air update was much better. It said, yeah, these are the things we fixed and it was much more verbose. So I don't know if that first one was just a test or if they had a different engineer on staff <laughs> that day who wrote better release notes. I don't entirely know. Let's talk about this massive screen because this is overkill, right? Yeah, I really don't like it very much. It just feels like they took a big tablet and they stuck it in because Tesla has a big tablet and mm, everyone else has a big say, tablet. Yeah. And it doesn't really add that much to the experience. It just kind of detracts for me because I have to look down to operate the climate controls. It's There are lots of buttons. There are lots of buttons which I like very much, but then the thing that I most want buttons for is the climate control. Right. And it doesn't have that. As you noticed, I turn the screen off and that's something that's important to note. You can turn it off if it's too much of a distraction. You just press and hold that, that ring button there. Uh, the volume knob and it goes to that kind of sleep screen which I think at night time is going to be useful because I don't like bright screens at night time. The other thing that is you know very important to note is that these touch screens are not always the easiest to use because there's no tactile buttons. It's not a case of glancing down and touching it. Because this version of the truck has hands-free I think it's maybe a little safer to be able to just glance down and touch it. But I think I would also rather have buttons. Now, if you go for the XLT and lower, you get a, a more standard center touchscreen display. It's about 12 inches and it is a landscape rather than a portrait. However, the portrait screen in this truck looks far better than the portrait screen, the same portrait screen in the Mustang Mark-E. It does. It fits better in here, I think, because there is a more utilitarian kind of design aesthetic, despite mm -hmm. all the froofy materials in mm -hmm. here, the suede on the door, which incidentally is already worn out. Uh, wow, yeah, no, it is. Um, the, the screen, you can get away with having a big screen just kind of stuck there yeah. in a way that the Mackie doesn't so much. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know what? I, I know I've talked about this already, but I'm already starting this. My back is starting to be a little bit irritated by this, this platinum seat, these fold flat seats, which are optional on the platinum trim. You have to pay extra for them. And Ford has actually, I believe, stopped building a lot of its platinum trims with this option because there's so many parts that this truck needs for those seats that it's part of the you know, the ongoing parts shortage and Ford is rather keen to get trucks out and is building trucks without the fancy seats just to get trucks out. My truck does not have them. So I have some issues with the way that you can spec this truck. If you want an F-150 Lightning, you have four choices on paper. You have the Pro variant, you have the XLT variant, you have the Lariat, and then you have this one, the Platinum. If you go for the Pro version and you do not own your own business and have a fleet, you cannot order the Pro with extended range, which I think is a terrible, terrible error on Ford's part. Because I think if Ford made a fifty-one to $57,000 entry level, long range F-150, even if it had all of the, you know, the, the basicest of basic trims, people would still want that because it's a very, very good proposition. So if you want an extended range, you have to buy the XLT, but the XLT extended range is t nearly $20,000 more than the standard range XLT, which is by the way, why we ended up getting the Lariat, because if I wanted an extended range XLT, it would have cost me about $71,000, $72,000 when I bought the truck. So it'd be now like 77, whatever. And you don't get hands-free 
Blue Cruise with the XLT. That's something you can only get on the Lariat and only on the Lariat extended range, as far as I'm aware. Hmm. So to get the truck with that, the hands-free and the long range, you have to spend 80,000 or now it's like 87,000. And then this is at the top end, you know, touching $100,000. Because of that, it's very difficult to recommend that, that this is a good work truck. The entry level version is, is almost intentionally crippled to the point that you have to be content with having a shorter range in order to buy one. Part of that is probably that Ford know that they'll make more profit on the fancier trucks. But part of it is they have a first mover advantage. They are really in a place where there is no competition for that work truck segment. That half ton work truck. Yeah, because the Rivian R1T is more expensive. Yeah. And it's not a, it's a lovely truck, but it's not a work truck. This is the closest thing we've seen to date to a work truck, but let's not kid ourselves. I think the Silverado EV is not going to be a work truck. No. The Hummer EV is not a work truck. And the Tesla Cybertruck, no matter what you say, is not a work truck. I think the F-150 Lightning is the closest. And I hope that for future model years, Ford reconsiders and makes an extended range pro trim available to anyone who wants to buy it. Because I genuinely believe Ford would have sold lots of them. So there we go. The F-150 Lightning Platinum. Ford has tried to hit the middle ground with this truck. It's tried to make a truck that is one that will appeal to the weekend warrior, someone who needs to go to the DIY store at the weekend, maybe take their bikes out and go off-roading somewhere, take a canoe or a kayak or tow something. Yeah. It's not really a vehicle that you're going to want to use day in, day out as a work vehicle, although I think the pro version would probably be different. Yeah, I'd love to get my hands on the pro version because I think that really is a work truck. And I think it's important to note here that when Ford said, hey, we've got this, this truck, do you want to drive it? We undernerd a lot because I own, as I've mentioned several times, I own the Lariat, the next level down. But I wanted Kate to experience this. I thought that it would be better for us to review a vehicle that wasn't my own because I've made some modifications to mine. And we did say to Ford, do you have a pro? And they said, no, not at the moment. They are aware of it. Ford knows that we want to review one and fingers crossed, we will get a pro at some point, which is vinyl seats, very functional. Yeah. And about half the price, more than half the price, in yeah. fact. And I can see that being really popular with fleets. I can see that being a vehicle that really resonates with people who need it as a work truck. This is much more of a leisure vehicle and it's very good at that. The ride uh, from the independent rear suspension, incredible. One of the best pickup rides I've ever experienced. Close to the Rivian R1T, they both have strengths and weaknesses in their handling. The Rivian R1T blows this out of the water when it comes to off-road capabilities, but on the flip side, the R1T has all of that air suspension and all of that fancy suspension componentry and wizardry that can raise the truck up and lower it down, which much like the Hummer pickup, could go wrong. This is just basic physics. Yeah. And that's something I think we have to say good on Ford for, for not trying to make this more complicated than it needs to be. I think Ford do a really good job of keeping things simple on the mechanical front, helps keep the cost down, helps keep it not so much in this trim, but in the lower trims, much more affordable, which I think is really important. I think also from a styling point of view, Ford needs to be praised for keeping fairly true to the original F-150. But we do also have an issue with the fact that it is massive. And there are lots of people in lots of markets that aren't the US and Canada. There are lots of people in the US and Canada who are like, I like this idea, but this is about 20, 30% bigger than it needs to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Maverick, if that comes out as electric, that is going to be such a great vehicle when that's, when that's ready for the market. And while this shares a lot of the top with a, a regular F-150 and that's helped keep costs down, everything kind of from the, from the bumper down yeah. is custom. A lot of people have said, well, no, Ford just modified the chassis. Honestly, if that's what Ford did, it did a really good job. Yeah. 
A lot of people, a lot of critics who haven't actually driven the F-150 Lightning say it's a compromised vehicle and it's never going to be any good. But there's nothing behind the wheel that makes me think this is a compromised vehicle. No, it is, as you said, it is the best vehicle I have driven that's a pickup. I have driven several pickups. I've driven a lot of trucks over the years. This is the best, which if, I hate to say it because it's huge and I think it's oversized and all the kind of things that I say because I'm British and I think cars should be small. And based on the feedback that people are getting from, I'm, I'm hearing from Rivian owners, if I had to choose between a Ford and a Rivian, while I think the Rivian is, is a better execution for most people, I don't think I would put my own personal money behind Rivian because Rivian is still growing. It's still having all of those teething problems with parts, with things breaking. I've seen multiple videos of people complaining about things breaking or not having things work in the way they want because Rivian is a startup and it's dealing with startup things. Ford's just like, it's making mistakes. By golly, it's making mistakes. But it seems to own them in a different way. Yeah. There is, however, a massive fly in the ointment and it's something I must bring up and it's something that I only know because I'm an F-150 Lightning owner and that is the Sunrun Home Integration System and the, the way in which Ford is working or doesn't appear to be working with Sunrun over this. Sunrun's competency in this area is, is terrible. You, you go on any Ford forum and you see people complaining about Sunrun having all kinds of issues, not calling customers back. The week we're filming this, yesterday in fact, I was due to have a phone call with a Sunrun representative to talk about putting a home integration system into my home and they stood me up, they didn't call. So that is unfortunately a big issue. That is very disappointing to hear because it, that it really is one is. of the primary selling points that they've really pushed for this vehicle. It really is. And because we're, I'm, in, I'm in Oregon, I can probably go with a third party installer and get it installed anyway. But just, you know, you put so much money into this vehicle, say it can run your home in a power cut. And as far as I know, there are two or three people in the whole of North America who actually have it installed. But would you recommend somebody buy the Platinum? I think it really depends on what you want it for. I would probably not recommend the Platinum. I think the Lariat's got most of the bells and whistles that people yeah. would want. But if you want it as a work truck, I would say no. I mm -hmm. would say the inside is too froofy, it will get trashed. Mm -hmm. I think if you want it as a weekend warrior and you want to go camping in it and you like all the bells and whistles, then yeah, sure, knock yourself out. If you've got the money. Yeah. That's it for today and for the Ford F-150 Lightning Platinum. If you like the video, please consider giving it many thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link right down there. And if you really like this video, why not leave us a super thanks. It's easy to do and everything you do send our way goes towards helping us, all of us make great content. If you haven't already, do make sure you've subscribed to this channel and to our other channel, Transport Evolved Take Two, and give that bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire crew who are all here today. Go out to everyone who makes this channel possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who watch the video and share it with your friends, maybe your enemies too. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name here on our right and if you have just joined we're sorry if your name isn't currently showing we currently render the list out every week or so but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance thanks to our self-driving tier supporters chris maxwell pedro muro pinheiro patrick boyarski bennett elder brian newton david kitchen michael goad ricky leong andrew martin guido drahota brophy wolf tezarin the gong Gordon C., Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Dan Blair, Jim Burness, Chris Ascenter, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And of course, out of this world thanks to our star man supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R., JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Graylon, Matthew Drobnak, Kevin Burrowbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, and of course, Ian. Ian. 
If you'd like to be part of that amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below. You can hit the join button to support us on YouTube or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or by buying something from our cool swag store. There are links below. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching all of these videos and sharing it around really does make a difference to our ad revenue. Thanks for joining us. And as always, keep, keep evolving. evolving.